Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming, and it's my great pleasure to open this uh, keynote speech session with Professor Paulo Nogueira Batista Jr., which uh, the Brazilians certainly know him, but for the international students and scholars, he is one of the most important Brazilian economists, for sure, in both uh, economical and political uh, aspects, because he, beyond the, 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 the academic contributions, he has been a policymaker. Policy uh, he has taken part in uh, recently in, in some really important institutions and also in the constitution of the BRICS the, as a group. So he, has, he is a former director, executive director of Brazil and some other countries, 10 other countries maybe, at the IMF. And uh, later he has gone to Shanghai to be the vice president of the New Development Bank. And he is a key person at, in the constitution of the BRICS group. Uh, you once told me that uh, in, in the well, uh, actually, besides Celso Amorim, which is one of the key persons also in this construction, um, uh, Professor Paulo Nogueira uh, has somehow followed all this, uh, this history of constitution of BRICS as a group, and obviously this uh, financial institution, the New Development Bank. Uh, so he will tell us a little bit of this whole story. Uh, he is launching a book which is also related to what he's gonna is talk today. The name of the book, uh, help me to translate it, it's not easy, but uh, Brazil is not the backyard of any country. Uh, Brazil is okay, Brazil does not fit in, into anyone's backyard. Uh, and it's the, the backgrounds of an economist who has uh, worked in the IMF and the NDB. This is the subtitle of the book, which you will be launched in, in, in a few months. So thank you very much, Professor Paulo, for coming here again. And the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Can you hear me well at the back? So thank you, first of all, to the organizers for inviting me to speak at this BRICS Winter School. We have agreed to conduct our dialogue in English because all Brazilians, I wouldn't say all, but most Brazilians that are studying at Unicamp and other Brazilian universities can understand and even speak English, whereas uh, all of the, the language, the working language of, of the BRICS has been English since the very beginning, which is an advantage for South Africans and Indians, of course, but which shows also our difficulty from escaping from the dominance of the Anglo-American world. <laughs> so we have, we've been conducting the business of the BRICS since the very beginning in English. Let me be first the topic that we agreed that I would speak about, the BRICS process as a whole, and in particular the financing mechanisms of the created by the group, namely the Contingent Reserve Arrangement, which is the monetary fund of the BRICS, and the New Development Bank, which is the, let's say, the World Bank of the, that, the, that the BRICS created. No? These, this is a vast topic, let me tell you. I, I, I asked, uh, I asked uh, Bruno to guide me a little bit because my tendency would be to speak too much and we have only two hours so we'd, I'll try to speak, I'll speak an hour and leave you to the last hour for our debate so that you can raise the issues that you, that you are interested in. Mm -hmm. But since we are in an academic uh, conference, let me tell you that I'm going to speak as a practitioner but uh, I, I have noticed over the years that this, this process of the BRICS and the institutions that the BRICS are creating is a vast topic for academic research. And actually research on BRICS and on the bank of the BRICS and on uh, the contingent reserve arrangement has started already at the academic level, including some very good PhD theses. That I, uh, that I know not because I've been doing a research in the, in the various universities of our countries, but because some scholars come to me 
as a source, as a source of uh, testimony, as a source of uh, documents. And so there's a, there's a few PhD theses that are really outstanding on the BRICS. Two in the University of Sao Paulo, I would, I would mention, and also one in Switzerland. The three authors came to me during the process of elaborating their thesis, so that I, I got to know them and their work, and it's really very good. I encourage you, those of you who are interested in economics, international economics, geopolitics, international governance, international relations, to look at the BRICS as a, as a field, as a new field, where a lot of original research can and should be done. And before I go into the topic itself, let me speak a little bit more about myself. Bruno has already done so in very generous terms. But uh, let me tell you wh what I did in the last uh, 10 or 12 years so that you know where I'm coming from and what sort of perspective I can offer you. Huh? I was, uh, in 2007, I moved from Sao Paulo to Washington to become the executive director for Brazil and, ten of the ten and a number of other countries in the IMF in Washington as a member of the board. And from that date on, uh, I worked not only in the IMF, but often as a delegate of Brazil in the G20 process and in the BRICS process. So I, I, I started working with the BRICS from the very beginning in 2008, and I worked continuously with the BRICS until 2017 when I returned to Brazil. So I worked, when, when I left Shanghai in, in 2017, that's what I, I, I wanted to say to, to Bruno. Uh, I was one of five per persons who had been in the process of the BRICS since the very beginning. Only five. These five persons, some of them slightly more important than me, Putin, the president of the B Central Bank of China, who in the meantime has also left, and uh, two delegates, delegates from Russia that were constantly in the process since the very beginning, Sergei Storchak and Andrei Bokarev, and myself. So only five, because as, as governments change, huh? it's a long period, 2007, 2000, 2008, 2017, and ministers change, presidents change, prime ministers change, teams change, so this, the, the, the number of people that know the process from the very beginning, now, now we all have only three persons in the process in the very beginning, Putin, uh, Storchak, and Bokarev. <laughs> the, all the others know the process but n do not have the or origin of the process so I can tell you how the, I, I took part in the negotiations of the BRICS to create the two institutions that they have created it's mostly with I worked mostly in the negotiation of the CRA the contingent reserve arrangement which is the monetary fund of the BRICS I also worked on the NDB but I'm more on the monetary fund but I was invited by President Dilma Rousseff to go to Shanghai in the, to the bank. So I'm, I then moved to the other institution that the banks created more, more closely and stayed two and a half years in Shanghai. So I'll be telling you, it's an insider story that I'm, that I'm telling you. I'm not going to focus on episodes or, 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 or conflicts, or just to give you an, an overall view of the BRICS process and then I will speak a little bit about the CRA and a little bit about the New Development Bank to try to give you a flavor of what the process and these, ins and these mechanisms mean. Right? Uh, can you hear me well? Acoustic okay? Okay. So I, I'll start uh, with a little bit of the history. The BRICS process from the very beginning, it started in 2008. Before that, the BRICS were basically an acronym created, you know by whom? Jim O'Neill, an economist at Goldman Sachs. It had no political reality. When I arrived in Washington in 2007, the BRICS did not exist as a grouping. Not in the fund, not in the G20, nowhere. In 2008, one of the five countries started the process. You know which country did so? Do you? Russia. Russia was the, the country that started it. Notice that this was started early 2008, before the outbreak of the crisis, before the collapse of Lehman Brothers and the outbreak of the crisis, and before the G20 was transformed into a leaders' forum with presidents and vice presidents and, and prime ministers. Right? 
four prime ministers. So, and before, way before the major confrontation between Russia and the West, which arose out of the crisis in Ukraine and out of the issue of Crimea, Crimea. that was in 2014. So Russia approached the original four, original other three members. South Africa only joined later, as you know, in 2011. Russia approached China, Brazil, and India, and there was very good receptivity to the Russian idea to create a group, a BRICS grouping. Huh? They, they came at, at very different levels, huh? in the capitals, in foreign ministries, in finance ministries, in the fund, the Russian director, Alexei Morzhin, visited his three, the Chinese, the Brazilian, me, and the Indian, and brought the idea to us. The same occurred in the World Bank. So it was a, a coordinated move from the Russian state. You know? By the way, it's very important to notice that we're talking about a grouping that is a, a, a mechanism of cooperation of states, not of governments. Huh? So what we expect is that whatever happens in the politics of South Africa, India, Brazil, Russia, China, that the Russian, Chinese, Brazilian, Indian, South African state are committed to this cooperation mechanism as a long-term project. Huh? In 2017, when I was still living in China, China was the host of the BRICS process. China presided the process. And the President, uh, President Xi Jinping spoke about the first golden decade of the BRICS and proposed a discussion of what the BRICS would expect for the next ten, 10 years, for the next second decade which he said he expected to be a second golden decade. No? So it's a long-term process. As you know, you've been discussing, I believe this, I'm talking to the foreigners now, here not to the Brazilians, you know that Brazil has undergone very important political changes since 2015, since 2016 in reality. No? But contrary to some rumors and to some, some expectations, Brazil did not depart from the BRICS or weaken its presence in the BRICS. You can say that Brazil's presence has become weaker given the, the difficulties that Brazil has as a, as a country, economic and political. But Brazil has not become absent in the process. Brazil is chairing the BRICS process this year, as you know. The summit will be in Brasilia in November. President Bolsonaro presided the BRICS informal meeting on the sidelines of the G20 summit in Osaka, Japan, recently. So the process continues, despite the changes in South Africa, important changes political in South Africa, important changes political in Brazil. No? The process continues because it, is, it should be seen, at least so far, as a state. It's not, it's not the government of Lula or of Dilma or Bolsonaro, it's Brazil as a state, as a sovereign state that is participating in the BRICS process. Eh? Now, what, look at the five member countries. You've done so, I'm sure. Eh? What, is it, what, are, what, is it, what is important to notice? First of all, as soon as it came public that in 2008 that the four, Brazil, Russia, India, China, had become, had decided to form a cooperation mechanism, the impact was enormous. I can tell you because I, I was in Washington in, in the IMF and we noticed immediately the impact that this decision created. It was almost immediately recognized as a grouping that the West, Americans and Europeans, had to take into account whether they wanted to or not in, as part of the governance discussion process in, uh, in, uh, in Washington and elsewhere. No? So why is this true? Why is this to be expected? Look at the five countries. Huh? They are large, especially the four original BRICS. Huh? And each of them have an important role in their regions. Huh? China, I would say, is a, a country that has already an effect on practically all parts of the world. China has become a, a global country. But even the other four have a very strong presence in their regions and also outside their regions, eh, depending on the political circumstances. Eh? So for instance, South Africa is, together with Nigeria, the largest economy in Sub-Saharan Africa. And in terms of per capita income, perhaps it's one of the largest, highest in, in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, if not the highest, eh? South Africa. 
uh, Brazil is the largest country in, in Latin America, and Brazil has a singularity. It is different from the others because it's the only Portuguese-speaking country in the, in the Latin American region that has always made us slightly different from the others. Huh? Language is important, as you know. No? Russia. Russia is a very interesting country, in my opinion. And Russia is, is partly Europe, partly Asia. No? And Russia has always been divided as to how, how Russia sees itself. Huh? I think Russia sees itself mostly as a, what's the term, a Eur Eurasian country, right? I was talking to an acquaintance, a Russian, a Russian lady once, a few years back, and I asked her, tell me, what, what, uh, and what do you think Russia is, European or not? And she said, no, oh, we're not part of Europe. We have nothing, sm she said smiling, we, have, we cannot be compared to all those little countries there in Europe. <laughs> That's, Russia sees itself as too big to be simply inserted into Europe, you know? And it's true. And it has a large Asiatic part, you know, which is very important. It's significant, I was talking on the way here to one of your Russian participants, it's significant that Russia's held two summits since the BRICS process started. The first one, not by, f not by chance, the first summit was in Russia, because Russia initiated the process was in Yekaterinburg, which is, I believe, in the Urals, huh? East, uh, west of the Urals, right? Or east of the Urals, right? Slightly east of the Urals. And the second summit held in Russia five years later, in 2015, 2015, yeah, was um, in uh, Ufa, also in the Asiatic part of Russia. I believe, I never heard this said by the Russian officials, but I believe the choice of these cities is to indicate the fact that Russia is a Eurasian country, right? Not, not to be seen as part of Europe or, or part of Asia only. No? If you look at China, for example, China, China stands out in East Asia, always, because of its millennial civilization, because of its size, right? Because of its weight, in the region and in the world increasingly. So it's a very special country in East Asia. And India is the largest country in South Asia, right? So each of the five countries is a very important player in world economics and world politics. Huh? Of course, it's, uh, how do you say it in English? I forget, but it's, it's a lopsided arrangement, the BRICS, because one of the five is much larger than the other four. Right, in economic terms, which is China. And the relative weight of China has increased more compared to Russia, Brazil, and South Africa since the BRICS were created. Not compared to India, because India has been growing very quickly too, even more than China in some years. But uh, Russia, Brazil, and, China, and South Africa have lagged a little bit in the more recent period. No? So it's a very... But I, I, I've always asked myself, you know, maybe you don't remember, because some of you are very young or, or joined the discussion about BRICS later, but when we started off in 2008, there was a lot of skepticism. Skepticism that was echoed repeatedly by the Western press, which is, this is an artificial coalition. What has Brazil got to do with Russia? and South Africa later with China. These are very different countries, huh? different in culture, different, different in history, different in language, etc., etc., etc. Despite all these differences, which are quite obvious, huh? there are certain basic similarities. I think one basic similarity, and that one is very important. It's size. Size. Oh especially the four original brick, Brazil, Russia, and in China, have this feature. There's one point I'd like to stress to you, which is you cannot understand the BRICS if you do not take that into account. The four original BRIC countries are among the five only countries in the world, five, that are at the same time in the list of ten largest countries by area, by population and by GDP. It's the United States and the four brick, the four original brick. No one else has this 
the presence in the list of the 10 largest countries by size of GDP, by size of territory, and by size of population. So this, these give, this, this common trait gives these countries capacity to act independently, potential to do so, right? Which smaller countries, smaller developing countries, smaller emerging market countries do not have in the, to the same degree. And that's a very important thing to... Uh, but the other, the other common trait, which you should also never forget in my opinion, is that, okay, they are, they are five or five large countries uh, of emerging market economies, but why do they need to work together? There's one major reason. That reason is that these five countries consider themselves to be insufficiently re represented in the, govern in the international governments, governance of the world as constituted mainly by the Europeans and especially by the Americans after the Second World War. I'm thinking note especially here of the World Bank and of the IMF, the Bretton Woods institutions, where we are represented, but not to the extent that we would like to be. The Europeans and the Americans are, especially the Europeans more than the Americans, are clearly overrepresented in the major financial institutions of the multilateral world. We have been attempting for quite a considerable time to change this. This attempt continues. We have not given up. But at one point we have realized that we would benefit Russians, Brazilians, Indians, Chinese, South Africans from working together in the G20, in these institutions, to try to show to the Americans and to the Europeans that they need to recognize new realities in the 21st century, when the world is no longer a world so strongly dominated by the North Atlantic axis, right? Western Europe and the United States. So this is, this is the background that I think it's indispensable now, you know, since 2008, we have been meeting so often and so repeatedly that the BRICS process has expanded enorm enormously in terms of coverage. What we see here today is one example of this, the BRICS universities eh, moving together to work together. So now it's difficult. We have so many topics that we discuss jointly in the BRICS process that the BRICS has become a sort of an octopus in terms of coverage. But I would submit to you, my view may be biased because of my, 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 my experience, my professional experience, is that the BRICS process began as an economic and financial process. And mind you, not as, a, not as an issue of integration between these countries, no economic and financial process whereby these countries join forces to change international governance. Fundamentally, I think that was the original motivation and that remains to this day one very important aspect of the BRICS process. So, as some people have already noticed, it's, it's sort of misleading to call the BRICS a bloc you know, or an alliance. Even the term alliance may be misleading. Because on many issues, the BRICS never aspired to act jointly. For example, Russia has a conflict with the West, acute one, since 2014, acute. Brazil, China, India are not part of that conflict. We can even occasionally take a stance that helps Russia, but we are not siding with Russia in this conflict. Lula didn't do that in the case of Brazil. Dilma didn't do that. And Temer and Bolsonaro would do that even less, as you know. <laughs> but the fact that relations with the United States are not discussed in the BRICS process is not unexpected. Because the BRICS process is a cooperation mechanism with a certain focus. It's important to understand that because that generates a lot of misunderstanding if you don't understand that we have a focused cooperation mechanism. So when Brazil and Russia, or Brazil and China, diverge on Venezuela, this doesn't mean that we're going to necessarily discuss Venezuela in the BRICS meetings. No. There's no need for the BRICS to take a joint stance on Venezuela. Of course, we know the realities of politics. Eh? 
you know that if if China, Brazil, and Russia disagree strongly on an issue as important as Venezuela, this affects the level of common trust and confidence in the group. It's not that it's not important, but it's important to notice that we never aspire to have a joint external international policy for most topics in the case of the BRICS. So, I would go th quickly through the, what I see the major phases of the BRICS process, but my stance here is I'm looking at the BRICS as a process of cooperation of these four and then five countries in topics of international governance, especially the Bretton Woods institutions and the G20. That's the focus of what I, was I will quickly try to explain to you now. I would say that, broadly speaking, the BRICS process had uh, three phases. The phase one is from 2008 to 2010, 2011. Phase two from 2011 to 2014 and phase three from 2015 onwards. This per periodization, as every periodization, is always somewhat arbitrary. I'll briefly explain to you why I'd, I chose this periodization. 2008 is the starting point because, as I told you, that's when Russia approaches China, Brazil, and India, and the process starts. In the first three, four years, our work together was chiefly to try to push towards a change in the IMF and in the World Bank in the context of the G20. Remember, the G20 includes all five BRICS countries. From the very start, back in the 1990s, when Clinton, Bill Clinton, proposed the creation of the G20, the five future BRICS countries were already there, uh, along with others. So we worked together in the G20, and our, our coordination in the G20, in the IMF, and in the World Bank was to try to push for change. But let me explain something important to you. The BRICS process was never confrontational. We never, we never appeared in the press, in the media, or in the meetings in open, aggressive confrontation with the West. On the contrary, we always appeared as a group of emerging market countries that recognize the importance of international cooperation, the importance of partnerships, the importance of coordination. We were not in the business of trying to produce a revolution. That was not our attempt. Not the attempt of China, Russia, uh, India, Brazil, South Africa. No, we were working as cooperative members of the international community, but stressing that the international community had to recognize that the institutions were not reflecting the reality of the world anymore. They were outfashioned, old-fashioned, outdated. Hmm? And we worked together to push this basic message. Hmm? Now, in this phase one, remember, phase one is, coincides with the deep crisis in the West, in the North Atlantic countries. The deepest crisis since the 1930s. So they were vulnerable and they needed us. They were eager to have the cooperation of the BRICS and other countries, and other important emerging market countries, to jointly produce an approach that would help the world escape from that deep crisis. You know, the Americans and the Europeans are very good at wording. Uh, and the wording is very important. And they, they created the, the expression, we have to face the global crisis. It was their crisis, essentially. But they named it global crisis to encourage everyone to participate. Of course, the crisis in important countries as the United States and Europe had repercussions in other countries, in other regions, including in the BRICS, of course, needless to say. But it was fundamentally a crisis that originated and was deeper and stronger in the financial systems and in the economies of the United States and of the countries of the, Europe of the European Union. So my Indian colleague, do we have anyone from India here? At least uh, my Indian colleague in the IMF, executive director, very intelligent man, Hakesh Mohan, he said, let's not call this a global crisis. I, my, so I propose we name it the North Atlantic financial crisis. <laughs> and I used to say, inspired partly by this, 
the, uh, the f International Monetary Fund should be renamed North Atlantic Monetary Fund reforms. That's the way we, we try to, s to provoke and push our, our friends and colleagues from America and, and Europe to understand that they needed to open space for us. Huh? So they needed us at the time. Can you, can you believe that when on two occasions, and that was a, quite surprising for everyone, for the Chinese, for the Russians, for the Brazilians, for the Indians, for the South Africans, well, South Africa was still not yet at the time with us. In 2008, in 2009, on two moments, on two occasions, in Washington and London, Timothy Geithner, who was the Treasury Secretary of the United States, asked to participate in the BRICS ministers' meetings. He asked to be invited for part of the meeting. And he came. He came with a, a small team and di had a dialogue about, with us about the crisis, about what he expected that the BRICS could do to help, you know. So, you know, for Brazilians, South end of complex, I will say that only in Portuguese. <laughs> Brazilians were quite, I remember some Brazilians officials saying, wow, Geithner is coming to our meeting, what's this? Everybody was, was surprised and even amazed by the fact that the Americans were so in so deep trouble that they were asking to be invited to our meetings. <laughs> so, I'm just telling you, so in this context, in phase one of the BRICS, we negotiated a very carefully negotiated political agreement at the G20, which I will not go into details, I have no, I have no time for that. Essentially, this agreement was expressed in communiques of the leaders of the G20, with names of the leaders, saying fundamentally this, Brazil, Russia, China, India, other emerging market countries of the G20 will cooperate with the, the developed countries to solve the crisis, including providing funds to the IMF, the central institution in the crisis administration, we, we, we lent money to the IMF. China, Brazil, Russia, India, and uh, South Africa also, later. Huh? So we, instead of, be, of being borrowers of the fund, like India and Brazil had been in the past, South Africa, I believe, too, we became creditors of the fund. So it was a quite unusual situation, you know? Because when, normally, in the, for a Brazilian like me, when the United States had a deep crisis, we also entered into a crisis and normally had to go to the fund. And this time, the fund came to us asking for money. <laughs> Quite a striking difference. For me, in, in, during my lifetime, I went from a young official in the 1980s trying to negotiate a loan from the IMF to Brazil to the Brazilian executive director negotiating a loan from Brazil to the IMF. This from in a space of how many years? 30 years. So it's a well, quite fast-moving situation we have here. So, it was, so I'm telling you all this because the BRICS then, I believe, we never said this in public, but I believe that we were a little bit, perhaps, uh, over-optimistic about the sincerity of our American and European friends. Because as time went by, it became clear that they took the money, the institutions that they control, IMF, World Bank, took the money, but did not really move quickly enough or deeply enough to reform. And I must say that especially the Europeans were very uh, averse to changes, very, very, very clearly resistant to changes. And that's understandable because the Europeans are the ones that are more overrepresented in these institutions. So they were became they formed a block. Yes, there you can use the word block. Europe acts as a block in the G20, in the IMF, and in the World Bank largely, you know? and they blocked as a block the largely the reform of the fund. So at one point, we realized that the reform of the fund in the World Bank would be very very slow. That in fact, there had been a betrayal. It's a strong word that we never used in public, but it's a, I think it's not unfair to say that the, the agreement was not respected. It was a, a betrayal of the agreement we had. We support the fund and the World Bank as they are, but in exchange for that, there's a promise that they will be reformed. 
to allow for the emerging markets to have a more voice and more representation. That did happen to some extent, but more limited than needed. Huh? So at this point, we have phase two of the BRICS process. That's when the leaders, the ministers, the delegates begin to discuss the possibility, not of leaving, of course, the IMF or the World Bank, because again, the BRICS were never radicals. Huh? They were ref reformist nations, understand? Reformist nations, not radicals trying to overturn international governance. So we more or less silently started to work on our own institutions. And that's when phase two begins. I don't know if our Indian colleagues know, but uh, the country that initiated the process of creating the new development bank was India back when the atmosphere was right because India was frustrated. We were frustrated, all of us, with the lack of progress in Washington. And uh, some economists, some well-known so well economists, Joseph Stiglitz, uh, Stern, Nicholas Stern, Amar Bhattacharya, who's also Indian, and a few others, approached the Prime Minister Singh at the time and convinced him that a BRICS development bank would be something important to c contemplate. So India came to the other four and proposed that we examine the possibility of creating a, a new development bank. And we started doing so in 2012 in the New Delhi summit. That's when the, formally the decision was taken to initiate the process. Yeah. I can tell you, the new, the new development, the BRICS bank or the new development bank as initially conceived it was always soft, it's not to challenge, not to disrupt, to cooperate with existing institutions. But we would never have gone to the point of creating our own development bank if we were satisfied with the existing ones, with the existing multilateral development banks. I can tell you that for sure. And six months later, thanks mostly to Brazil, we started the negotiation of the contingent reserve arrangement. That's the monetary fund of the BRICS. So for the phase two was moved to a new plateau, a new level of cooperation, because we moved from fighting to reform existing mechanisms to creating our own, a bank and a fund. And that, that phase two was from 12, 2012 to 2014. I cannot go into details here. I participated in many of these meetings that led to the bank and led to the fund of the BRICS. Do you think it's easy? It's not. Even with only five countries, it's very difficult to move forward. It took us an enormous amount of effort to reach a consensus among the five. We worked very hard. It was a tough period. I, I was working from Washington. I often participated in the meetings. I, I traveled to all of, the, uh, all of our countries. Huh? Often when I had meetings in South Africa, in India, in, in Russia, in China, in Brazil. And finally we managed to achieve the, 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 the finalization of the two treaties for signature complete in the summit of Fortaleza, Brazil in 2014. So we are now exactly five years away from the date when the BRICS countries together in Brazil signed the treaty that created the Continued Reserve Arrangement and the treaty that created the, the new development bank. So uh, I, I propose to you that this is phase three. Phase three where we now create the institutions and start to operate the, inst the mechanism, let's put it this way, because the CRA is not exactly an institution, the bank is. The CRA is, is a, I would use the word mechanism to describe it. Eh? But so you see, it, it's, it's very important. Don't underestimate what this means. For the first time, look at, look at this. For the first time, a bank, a multilateral development bank, intending to have a global reach, was created by emerging market countries alone with no participation of developed countries, advanced countries, in the initial phase of the bank. Zero participation. We did it on our own. And the same goes for the monetary fund of the BRICS. This was created by the five countries with no participation, no technical assistance, nothing from developed countries. We worked on our own, based of course on the experience. Huh? 
when we developed the treaty that created the bank, we looked at the treaties of the existing development banks, beginning from the World Bank. When we created the monetary fund, we looked at the existing reserve pooling arrangements. Chiang Mai in Asia, Chiang Mai Initiative, of which China is a member. We looked at the, fund, uh, at the International Mo Monetary Fund itself, where I was at the time. That is a reserve pooling arrangement, very peculiar one, but it is. So we were basing ourselves pragmatically on what was actually going on. But we, st we did it from our own perspective, no? from the perspective of these five large uh, emerging market countries. No? So it was quite an achievement. And I must tell you that when I, when I was in Fortaleza, I came from Washington to Fortaleza in the northeast of Brazil, and we managed to sign the two treaties there, which was not a given. Eh? At the very last moment, our president, the lady Dilma Rousseff, was very unhappy about the fact that Brazil was not going to be a appointing the first president of the bank, and she threatened not to sign. <laughs> so, uh, we had to work with her. With the finan finance minister Mantega had to work with her to, to tell her it's more important to sign now than to than to to force the point that Brazil will indicate the first president, huh? and she finally agreed, and we signed both treaties there. And one year later, when we came to Ufa in the, in Russia for the next summit, the two organizations had been ratified by the five countries in in one year, in less than one year. The parliaments of the five countries and the ratification processes of the five countries had been completed in less than one year, and the bank, the NDB, started to operate in Shanghai July 2015, and all the mechanisms for the working of the CIA were in place by then, when we met in Ufa under the presidency of President Putin of Russia. So, at the time, was, I was a, a bit, maybe a bit optimistic, I said, <laughs> I said, when I was there in Fortaleza, I said to the press, well, Fortaleza will become, Fortaleza is a capital of the state in the northeast of Brazil. Fortaleza will be for the BRICS, what, what Bretton Woods was for the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. <laughs> the birthplace of the bank and of the fund of the BRICS. Huh? Now, what was the purpose of this? The purpose of this was to signal to the West, okay, we're here in Washington, we continue to be here. But since you do not open space for us, enough space for us, we're doing our own thing on the side. Not against you, huh? nobody is against you. The new bank, the new fund will work in co close cooperation with the International Monetary Fund, with the World Bank, with the ADB, with the African Development Bank, no. Cooperation is the key word that we always repeat it. But the West was looking at us sort of uneasily. I remember that Christine Lagarde was sort of surprised to see that we had finalized a monetary fund of, our own, fund of our own and she called the BRICS directors to her office to ask us what was going on. <laughs> we, we were very secretive about the process. <laughs> and at that point we could explain to her what, was the, what we were doing and, and she was eager to cooperate and eager to understand. And, and the World Bank was so eager to understand its potential competitor, the new development bank in Shanghai, that they created a unit to interact with the, the bank, even before the bank began to operate. So I, I was still in Washington at the time, and I met the unit of the World Bank before I met my colleagues, <laughs> the Indian president and the other vice presidents in Shanghai, because they were very active in, in trying to, you know, Let's keep this new fellow within our reach, no? within our, if possible, our control. No? And we were not afraid of discussing with them, not at all. We were eager to learn also from the existing institutions. To learn and, if possible, not commit the same mistakes. If we wanted to commit mistakes, let's make new mistakes, we used to say. No? not the same old mistakes that the older institutions already committed. No? So we were learning, we're not arrogant in the sense that we, we, we knew what the path was. No, not at all. We were cooperative and in a learning mode, in a partnership mode. Now, how, I'm, uh, I'm going overboard again, no? 
Okay. I don't want to speak too much, but I want to speak about at least 20 minutes more about phase two, if you allow me. Can I do that? Yes. 20 minutes. Phase, phase three now. Phase three is the actual operation of the institutions, of the mechanisms, the, the CRA and the NDB. About the CRA, I can be quick, not only because I don't want to speak too much, but because less has happened. The CRA is there. It's, it's ready to work. I'm not sure that all of you understand what a reserve pooling arrangement is. It's basically a mechanism whereby countries come together to commit to support each other if needed when balance of payments pressures arise. So th in this case, five countries come together and say, look, we will commit a certain amount of resources to countries that face potential actual balance of payments problems in the future in the group and the central banks of the BRICS countries were very concerned and cautious and you will notice that in the case of the CRA the official name is BRICS Contingent Reserve Arrangement. Why? Because central banks were eager to signal that it would not be easy for other countries to join the mechanism. They wanted to keep it within five basically strong countries eh, with high reserves strong balance of payments positions. Eh? Even so, I remember the Central Bank of Brazil was very, very afraid of this. Very, uh, Tombini was the Central Bank governor, and he was systematically cautious and even, I would say, uh, blocking the negotiation. The, the reason why Brazil did not block was that Dilma Rousseff, the president, was herself very interested in the BRICS process and in the CRA, and she saw herself as having originated the CRA, <laughs> which is partly true. She, it came from Brazil, and she was at the very beginning involved in the, in the first proposals. So she did not allow the Brazilian Central Bank to block. The Central Bank of Brazil, for example, was a bit concerned that South Africa might borrow from the, from the CRA. And uh, it saw this as a risk. And I used to say to, to the president of the Central Bank and to the Central Bank officials of Brazil, why are you so afraid of joining a cooperation mechanism with a country like China that has four trillion dollars in reserves? At the time, China had four trillion. Why is that such a risk for you, tell me? It was a little bit irrational in my opinion. No, but anyway, we surmounted these difficulties not easily because the Central Bank of Brazil was not the only Central Bank of the five that had reluctances. It had a lot of problems. And the way it worked out, I cannot go into details, is not exactly how it, I wanted it to work out. It's, it's a bit too travado, a bit too rigid in some respects because of the conservatism of the Central Banks. But it basically, basically is ready and, 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 and ready to operate. But there's something missing that the Chinese in particular wanted very much. Because, you know, it's, it's a large arrangement. It's a hundred billion dollars, uh, of which China com contributes about 40, I believe. And China is the main potential creditor in the arrangement, was always eager to have a surveillance unit, a physical place, an institution, where we would understand the risks the macroeconomic balance of payments problems of the member countries. You know, anyone from China knows the, the, the Chiang Mai initiative. You know that about that. It's a very important thing that China has been participating in since the very beginning. And Chiang Mai is a reserve pooling arrangement similar to the one we created, older, larger, and has a, reserve, uh, has a surveillance unit in Singapore that's well advanced. Now, the CRA, despite our efforts, does not has not yet created its own surveillance unit. So it's, it's a virtual reserve arrangement. It's an important point. You understand what I mean? The reserves are not deposited anywhere. They remain with the central banks and they will only be dispersed for what country in need when the need arises. So it's a potential or virtual reserve pooling arrangement. Different from the International Monetary Fund. The International Monetary Fund is an actual reserve pooling arrangement where the reserves are actually deposited with the fund. Mm -hmm. Shanghai is also a virtual reserve arrangement. 
So we're more similar to Chiang Mai than to the International Monetary Fund in, in Washington. Now I'm disappointed to see that uh, we signed the treaty in 2014. We are in 2019 and we have not yet reached an agreement among the five countries as to where the surveillance unit should be located. China wants it to be in Shanghai, in the same building where I was li working in the New Development Bank. And I, the other countries are a bit reluctant. I was reluctant too. I, I, we, I told the Brazilian government at the time, look, if, if we allow China to have the headquarters of the bank and of the monetary fund of the BRICS in Shanghai, Shanghai will become the Washington of the BRICS process. Headquarters of the BRICS, of the bank and of the fund. That's, that would be unbalanced. So I convinced the Brazilian government to propose Rio de Janeiro as headquarters for the surveillance unit. And the central bank formally proposed has a, reserved a, a floor in the central bank building in Rio de Janeiro to start out the surveillance unit. But the Chinese don't agree. And India later has appeared also wanting to headquarter the surveillance unit. So they have not yet reached an agreement the, 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 the fund is ready to work. It, can, it has gone through all the details operational to, to operate if needed, if a country should need support, but it's not uh, ready to move forward with a surveillance unit. And that's a disappointment. Huh? After five years, five years to discuss and not, not reach an agreement on where to put a small surveillance unit, small at the beginning, huh? It's frustrating. Shows a difficulty to move forward on on important practical points. Let me do one final thing before I move to the bank. There's a concrete evidence of the lack of confrontation between the BRICS and the West. Do you know that we have an IMF link in the Continued Reserve Arrangement? That means that countries can have access to the to the CRA of the BRICS, but up to a certain limit, free of any linkage to outside institutions. So above a certain limit, the country has to have an IMF program in place. So it's important to notice huh? that we were never trying to, dis to completely break away from the fund. We wanted to piggyback on the fund's capacity to do surveillance, to understand the economies. You know piggyback? There's the expression. Pegar carona in Portuguese. Pegar carona na capacidade do fundo piggyback on the capacity of the fund to understand and analyze individual economies. Eh? So we're very realistic, very moderate, very pragmatic, and uh, that's the way the BRICS process has always worked. Eh? For now, to, to finalize, I'll say a few words um, on, the, on the major mechanism created by, by us, by the BRICS, which is the New Development Bank. As I say, this, there's a vast field for academic research there, and this research has begun. There's papers being written, detailed papers. I myself will go to spend a, a, a short period as visiting researcher in Boston University towards the end of this year, and I will write a paper on the New Development Bank. There's a, 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 prof a, a researcher, American, called Christopher Humphrey, have you ever heard of him? He writes a lot on development economics, multilateral development banks, has written on the New Development Bank already. He's doing another paper on the New Development Bank. So research is ongoing. IPEA, is a, you know IPEA, Brazilian Institute, has one researcher, Luciana Scioli, has, has done a paper, recent one, on the New Development Bank. As I mentioned, there are PhD theses on the BRICS process and on the New Development Bank. So a lot of work is ongoing, and I do encourage you and your universities to look closely at this new area of, of research. Let me tell you that it's not an easy area to do research on. It may be misleadingly easy because it's at a lower level of abstraction as most economic research is done nowadays. Eh? But this is, is misleading because it, it requires very, very acute perception of how institutions work and actual careful research and understanding of institutions. And that's not easy at all. Huh? Not easy at all. 
when I was working in Washington and in, in Shanghai, I often read papers done by prominent, even, even prominent academics, completely wrong. Uh, wrong in the sense that the guy was writing without actually knowing what was happening, how the institution functioned, you know. So a method of research that really works in, these, in this sort of case is to do professionally prepared interviews with officials and former officials of these institutions. I can tell you, the fund, the, I, the IMF in Washington, if you go into the web page of the fund, there's a lot of information there. Try to understand it. It's not easy to understand. And some things that are there are put there in a way to make it difficult for you to understand. <laughs> so these institutions are complex. They pay lip service to transparency. So it's very difficult to understand them looking at official documents, communiques, treaties, policies, written policies, websites, you know. It's, it's quite a challenge. I think uh, one guy, if you want to understand the, for example, the International Monetary Fund, the one guy I would recommend is Paul Blustein, a specialized journalist who has written many books on the IMF, very good ones. And on the BRICS bank, I would recommend this, this guy I just mentioned, Christopher Humphrey who is an American working from Zurich, who has done a lot of interesting pieces on multilateral development banks. Anyway, that's just an academic uh, parenthesis. It's important for you to understand that, that we chose a name, New Development Bank, not by chance. The two things that stand out in the name, the fact that the BRICS acronym is not there, that's deliberate. You know, the press and the world often talks about the BRICS Bank, but the, the real name of the bank is New Development Bank with no reference to the BRICS. Yeah. First thing. The other thing is that the fact that it's called New. It's new because it's not only because it's recently created, but because it intends to depart from the normal practices of existing development banks in, in very, very many ways. Or I should say intended too, because the actual development of the bank in its first years has not, as I will try to explain briefly, has not lived up to the challenge of creating a truly new development bank so far. But anyway, it's a very ambitious project, a very ambitious project. As I told you, it's the first time that MDC, MDCs alone create a global bank, a bank that intends to be global. First time in history. And even more, it's the first time since Bretton Woods that a global multilateral development bank is created. Have you re do you realize that? Because since the World Bank was created, a bank that from the very beginning intended to be global in nature, all the other multilateral development banks that were created were regional. The Inter-American Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the African Development Bank, the European Investment Bank, and more recently, together with us, the Chinese. The Chinese have a lot of uh, ammunition. Eh? So they, at the same time as we created the New Development Bank, the China led a new a, a development bank in Shanghai, in, in Beijing, called the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Have you ever heard of this bank? Yeah? It's a very important bank, but also, as, you, as the name tells you, it's designed to be regional, basically Asian. Eh? Whereas the New Development Bank is the first time since the World Bank that a bank of global reach is created and by emerging market countries alone. Did we live up to the challenge? Partly. Partly. I can tell you from experience, from my two and a half years there, but also from, from my observation of the bank after I left from Brazil. Let me just tell you briefly some structural features of the bank. Do you, we're talking about a certain type of bank. It's important to understand that. It's a certain model of bank called Multilateral Development Bank, MDB. The first one was the World Bank. How does it work? It's a cooperative mechanism. Countries come together, pool capital, acquire a portion of the capital of the bank, a portion of the voting rights, and they use this paid-in capital to leverage resources by borrowing in the markets, right, using the strength of the countries that contribute and the strength of the policies that the bank designs. So it can do a multiple of the original capital by raising money in the market. 
And in these banks, they offer development loans, right? Development loans meaning loans that are long-term in nature for difficult projects in countries that would have difficult access to markets. So they fill a gap that markets cannot normally fill. They move into a gap, offer long-term lending to countries all over the world on the basis of capital supplied by the member countries. Eh? This is the model, the general model. We are part of that. The New Development Bank is the uh, one of 25 existing multilateral, more or less, development banks in the world, about 25. The first one was the World Bank. The most recent ones are the NDB in Shanghai and the AIIB in Beijing. Eh? Now, um, these are the, the, the common features, but already in the treaty that created the bank, for good or for bad, we departed from certain features that are normal in this sort of bank. First of all, the five founding members have an equal stake in the bank. Each of the five has 20% of capital and 20% of voting power. That's not what the Chinese wanted, by the way. The Chinese, during the whole negotiation process, pressed to have the fact recognized that larger countries could supply more capital and have a greater stake in the bank, and they were defeated on that point. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why they then decided to establish simultaneously the, an Asian infrastructure investment bank that they control. So this is important. It's very rare, very rare, in the world to have a bank where you have the equal governance of the founding members. Normally what you have is the predominance, the hegemony of one or more countries. For example, the United States has veto power over crucial decisions in the World Bank and in the IMF. China has reserved itself veto power on crucial decisions in the AIIB. But in the in the New Development Bank, no country has veto power. Because we were careful enough to design the decision process in the bank to avoid requiring unanimity for any decision. There's no requirement of unanimity for any decision in the bank. Because if, <laughs> if there were, all five would have veto power, right? on that particular decision requiring unanimity. We were very careful because we had learned from the European process the pitfalls of requiring unanimity. No? That would tend to paralyze the bank. Now, this is the design, the plan, no? now the reality. The reality is that the president of the bank, Indian, is a, is a very illustrious official, uh, private banker called K. V. Kamat, who was a head of a, one of the major banks in India for a long time. K.V. Kamat is a s very careful person, maybe too careful. And he was very reluctant to overrule any single country. So he, for most decisions, for almost all decisions during the time I was there, he worked very carefully to bring in all five countries in all decisions, which effectively meant that you were requiring unanimity in practice. This led to slow decision-making process, paralysis, problems, you know. We were, for example, we had a, a certain decision, not necessarily a crucial one, certain policy. Everything looked fine. We had the opinions of the five countries in. Then, for example, South Africa had second thoughts on something. And the opinion of South Africa, as you considered, submitted to the other four, and the process was delayed yet again. Then we overcame South Africa's objection. Then Brazil suddenly realized that it had forgotten to object to something else. And we had to speak to Brasilia, persuade the Brazilians to not to insist on that point. Or, if the Brazilians were adamant, bring the Brazilian point. And I, I, I was very impatient with this process. I told the president, we designed this bank not to work on the basis of unanimity. We're going to be extremely slow. But the president was very reluctant to displease any of the five founding members. I, I won't blame the president himself and only. Because yeah? there's something that the Chinese, from the very beginning, said in the meetings. Let's see whether a bank so constituted, with five countries having 20% each, will work in practice. You know what I realized? 
as a, as a theorist, I had we had, and I had contributed to this, designed the bank in a way that no one would have veto power. So we would have no United States of America inside the bank, right? But then I realized in practice that we had five United States. <laughs> Each one very, very own, with a strong sentiment of ownership with respect to the bank. And I must say, to be fair, that China of the four, five was the less, the less overwhelming mostly. Mostly. China was careful in, to respect the governance of the bank and did not push, very, did not throw around its weight. When China came, when Shanghai came in, at the time of the negotiation to propose, the, when I saw the best offer for headquarters is Shanghai. I'll be quite honest with my Chinese colleagues here. I was very concerned. China's already the largest BRICS of the BRICS. If we headquarter the bank, the main initiative of the BRICS in China, will not China overwhelm the bank? Then I went to, the, to be one of the vice presidents of the bank in Shanghai. And during my time there, China did not overwhelm the bank, in fairness. On the contrary, China supported the bank very much. When I say China, I mean Shanghai municipal government and Beijing. So if we are not successful so far in the NDB, this is not due to lack of support or problems created by the host country. We cannot say that, in all fairness. At least not during about two and a half years there. Maybe change, things change later and things never stay the same, but that's my testimony for the first two and a half years. So governance of the bank is quite a challenge and uh, if, if, the, if you, any of you are interested in doing research on international organization, on organization of international organization, I think it's very interesting to look at NDB from this perspective. The other thing, incidentally, won't go into that, is that we are very original in one respect. We and the bank in Beijing, the AIB, the board of directors does not reside in Shanghai. The directors live in the capitals of the countries. It's a non-resident board. And this has pros and cons. You know Keynes, John Maynard Keynes? Did I tell you this last year when I came here? John Maynard Keynes wrote extensively on the IMF and the World Bank as part of the negotiation process in Bretton Woods. And Keynes was very against resident boards. He was strongly f in favor of non-resident boards. And we decided to follow Keynes in that respect. We and the AIB, we are the first, the only two multilateral development banks of the 25 or so that have non-resident boards. And I'm not sure that Keynes was right after having experienced the reality of a non-resident board in Shanghai and the reality of a resident board in Washington, of which I was a member. Huh? But I don't have time to go into that. It's a, a question of institutional structure, quite important, so important that the, main, the major economist of the 20th century dedicated his brain power in detail to this issue in Bretton Woods. But new, what is new about the bank? I'll give you some examples. I won't, I won't try to, to do a complete coverage of what we intended to produce as new. First, I already said, it's the first global bank since Bretton Woods, the first global bank, or bank that intends to be global, not yet global, created by EM EMDCs alone. But with a very singular approach, we decided to base ourselves on country systems departing in that respect fundamentally from the approach taken by the existing development, multilateral development banks. Instead of coming to the countries, look, we can lend to you, but this is the policy, the set of policies, the set of requirements, the set of strictures that you need to follow because we, we have long experience, we are the best in the world, we are Americans and Europeans, we know what you need to do, we want to help you. It's a messiah complex that afflicts the Americans, the Europeans very much. Not so much Trump now, but normally, let's say. <laughs> normally the Americans and the Europeans have this sentiment of superiority with respect to the rest of the world. And they, they think they know what's best for us. Sometimes they may 
hit the right spot, but often they do not know enough about our countries to preach in detail about how to conduct a policy, how to conduct a project. No? So we decided to follow a different approach, to work on the basis of the country strategy and to respect the sovereignty of the countries that, came, that would come to us to raise loans. That sounds beautiful. It is beautiful. It's beautifully written. I wrote it in the strategy. <laughs> but one thing is to write it beautifully in principle. The other thing is to practice it. And I'm not sure that the practice of our bank in the time that I was there and later has been sufficiently coherent with our beautiful attempt to do something new in that respect. But it's there. The plan is there. And nobody has denied it. Um, that's one thing. The other thing, we want to be focused. The bank has a mandate on infrastructure and sustainable development. That's in the articles. So we want to depart from the so-called universal approach of the World Bank. You know, the World Bank is all over the place. Not, not only in terms of countries, but in terms of topics. You know, it covers everything you can imagine, from dams and, and uh, industries to saving the Siberian tiger does everything under the sun. And I noticed in my interactions with them that the quality suffers. The quality suffers. It's 14,000 staff. 14,000 staff. But the quality suffers because they have such a wide range of topics that they have a difficulty in building actual deep expertise in the wide range of things that they try to do. So focus. And we want it to be green I believe it's the only of the 25 multilateral development banks, it's the only one that has environmental issues inscribed in the Articles of Agreement, in the treaty that we signed in 2014. The other banks have been, have been doing this, but we are, we are green. At one point when I was there, we were 100% green in the sense that 100% of our funding and 100% of our projects were green by international standards, technically speaking. Huh? One, one time I went to Washington in a meeting of multilateral development banks and I told them, look, we are 100% green right now. And there was a sudden round of applause in the, in the meeting, which is unusual in meetings of technocrats. So I turned to my advisor and said, what are we doing wrong here? <laughs> to get such a round of applause <laughs> in Washington, D.C. But we were engaged. You know, see, this is important for us, you know, because countries like India, Brazil, China, where in the beginning, say 1990s, even early 2000s, we were sort of taking a back step in the issue of international cooperation on environment. We, we were pushing for the advanced countries to recognize that they fundamentally are the ones that destroyed the environment of the planet historically. And now they cannot contain our development because the planet is suffering. No? the accumulated effect of their industrial revolutions, first of all. Right? That's the stance we took, in a, in a nutshell. No? That has changed. We still recognize this issue, this shortcoming, this historical fact. But we are now very much concerned, we as countries, no? with the environmental degradation. Well, let me say that Brazil has been backtracking enormously in the present government. So the present government is, is an exception to what I'm saying, but, but the BRICS as a whole, and Brazil until last year, are very concerned with the environment. And this reflects itself in the bank that we created. Huh? Now, you can ask me, okay, so that's beautiful. Again, it's a green bank, working to focusing on green projects, sustainable infrastructure. What's the practice? Let me tell you that I cannot say I cannot tell you because when I go into the bank's website as an outsider now, there's not sufficient transparency about the projects. The, le the level of information about the projects that the bank has been approving is minimal. It's even embarrassingly low. Uh, so uh, this, is, this raises some doubts as to whether the bank is living up to its promises. Huh? How stringent, how strong, how consistent are our standards. Have we checked the country systems of the five countries sufficiently to use them as a basis for projects without social and environmental impacts, for example? I cannot say. 
the bank is supposed to do environmental and social assessments of the country systems. It does not publish them. It does them, apparently, but they're not posted. So we don't know their level of quality, their level of professionalism. So this is, this is a, a pity. But in any case, we wanted to depart. And for example, one important thing that the press caught on very early on, we wanted to operate in non, outside the dollar. And uh, with national currencies of member countries. Huh? That was a, a chief goal of the strategy of the bank, of the plans of the bank since the beginning. That's very interesting, huh? Politically it's interesting, but not, I'm not ma mainly concerned about the political aspect. It's mostly because of the projects themselves. One major issue with long-term financing of sustainable infrastructure projects, sustainability infrastructure, is the long-term in non-tradable sectors for the economists here, right? So you have an inconsistency between the revenue stream, which is non-tradable, and the dollar funding, which is in strong currency, in hard currency. This is a strong, because m almost all MDBs lend in strong currencies, in hard currencies, for projects that do not generate a revenue stream in hard currency. So we were trying to break this by introducing uh, national currencies. What happened? I've been looking at the big, this, this I can check in the, N, in the NDB. Right now we have 80% uh, of the approved loans in dollars still and 20% more or less in Chinese currency, in yuan. Nothing in rubles, nothing in Indian currency, nothing in rand, nothing in, uh, in real. So the bank, uh, the bank is now four years old. We started working in Shanghai in July 2015. So it has just completed its fourth year of operation. And it has not done yet a single approved loan outside China and all the rest in dollars. There's something even more concerning. I, I was talking to Bruno, I'm going to be realistic to you people. I'm an, I'm an enthusiast of the BRICS process. The NDB in Shanghai is the major result of the cooperation. But we cannot close our eyes to the weaknesses of what is going on. Do you know that the bank has approved so far in the board of directors, in the non-resident board, 35 projects? Uh, amount of 9.3 billion dollars. 9.3. How does that sound to you? It's not bad. It's not high, but 9 billion dollars is it's not world-shattering figure, right? But it's, you can say, well, it's a young bank, it's learning, it has approved 35 projects, 9 billion dollars. 20% of the value is in Chinese currency. Most of them are said to be green. We cannot check, but ap apparently most of them are green projects. The only bond that the bank has issued is a green bond, technically certified as a green bond. That I can say because I was there at the time. Not big, $400 million, but it's a green bond. Right? So it looks good, but it's misleading to the extreme. Why? Because what happens is this. I'm not sure this is common to all multilateral development banks, but the way the bank in Shanghai is working is like this. A project is prepared and presented to the board. It's a board document of, let's say, 60, 80 pages, depending on the project. And the board approves that. But that's not a contract. When you say, we have approved 35 projects, you have approved 35 documents of this type, not a contract. From the board document to the contract, you have to negotiate extensively. And then when you finalize the contract, you have to meet the conditions precedent for the contract to be signed. And then when you do finally sign the contract, you need to then com commence project implementation and commence disbursements. And that's when the bank becomes a reality, do you understand? A bank that disburses. Now, what do you, how, many, how much do you think the bank has disbursed in four years, it has approved 9.3 billion. How much has it disbursed? Any, any guesses? 500 million. 
500 million. And you know, of, this, of these 500 million, only 300, as much as 300, are for the BNDS, for the National Development of Brazil. A very easy disbursement, because it's a two-step loan. The Bank of Brazil, the Development Bank of Brazil, takes the loan and distributes the loan to projects inside Brazil in, in renewable energy. It's a good, it's a good loan, but what I'm telling you, it's easy to disburse a loan like that because the responsibility to conduct the projects, the relation with the projects themselves, is with the new de the, ba the development bank of Brazil. So, 500 million disbursements, of which 300 own, have come from from the loan to BNDS. So, wh what is happening? You see, the bank is receiving money from the five countries. On, on schedule, even some countries have anticipated paid-in capital. So the bank has a lot of paid-in capital. What does the bank do with that money? It pays staff, pays bills, and deposits the greater part of the money in secure bank deposits. So that's not what we created the bank for. Thank my God. I mean, after four years to have a bank that is basically receiving money from the five countries, depositing in, high, in, in safe, you know, liquid, basically liquid deposits, right? Why has the bank only issued one bond so far in four years? 400 million bond. It doesn't need to issue. It has no disbursements to meet. You see? Why did the bank take three years to have an international credit rating? It, 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 it had a good result, AA plus, good result. But it took three years. No problem, it had no need for international credit rating. It's not issuing any bond in the international market so far. So, these are only some examples, you know. Another thing, how many members do we have in the bank? The original five, after four years, the bank that was supposed to be global has only five members. It could well have been named BRICS Bank because it has not moved beyond BRICS. The Asian Inv Infrastructure Investment Bank in Beijing has 90 members, nine zero, including Brazil, including all the BRICS. It has moved very quickly to expand membership even outside Asia. So the bank in, she in Beijing that the Chinese lead is overshadowing the BRICS Bank in many respects, including in this one. It is, play, it is playing in practice the international global role that we intended to play. So, let me not uh, end on a discouraging note. The bank has done a lot. The bank is there. If you go to Shanghai in a few years, maybe next year already, you will visit an enormous 30-story building built by the municipal government of Shanghai for us, for the bank, only for the bank, will be impressive structure. The policies are there, the capital is coming in, we have an international credit rating, we have the basic policies in place, you know. But the bank is slow, is struggling to become an effective bank, you know, for reasons that we can discuss if you want in, in during the debate. I'm, I'm going to try to close now. Let me just tell you that Brazil has a major role to play in this process, not only because it's, it's uh, presiding the BRICS process this year, but Brazil has the right to appoint the second president of the bank. Remember I told you Dilma Rousseff was mad because she wanted to appoint the first. <laughs> we didn't manage to get that, but she got to Brazil the second president. And the second president replacing K.V. Kamat will be a Brazilian taking office in July 2020, in less than a year. So there's an opportunity to restart the bank with a new administration. The vice presidents will also be replaced shortly thereafter. We will need, we, the bank needs a restart, really, because it has done some things, but it's very, moving very slowly, and it's not uh, living up to the expectations that the BRICS raised when they uh, created this bank. So that's what I wanted to say, Bruno, just to give you an overview. I hope I didn't bore you with too many technical, specific bank details, but I'm ready to discuss any issue related to the BRICS that you would like to raise the, during the debate. Thank you.